Calvinists strip God of their of, of his mercy. I said, what are you talking about? I said, if you look at the doctrine of election, I said, you could simply call it the doctrine of mercy because that's exactly what it is. I said, what are you talking about stripping God of his mercy? I said, if you're going well, to say that... the doctrine of grace, actually. Yeah. I, I said, if you're going to say that, you would also have to say that Calvinists strip God of his justice, too. And she's like, yeah, they do. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I mean, it was such a bizarre... This, this onslaught that you know she engaged in with me and I'm like wait whoa slow down stop stop you know and you can't really get her to slow down and it was just I was starting to get a headache afterwards but it, it's I, I don't I said you will never hear a, a Calvinist say that this doctrine strips God of his mercy well it's no, to the Calvinism, it's to the opposite of that Calvinism rubs a lot of people the wrong way and even some Christians, and the, the, the strange thing about it is on Facebook, like, nobody was Calvinist this and Calvinist that, it was always just Christians this and Christians that. Over here, they make sure, you know, like, like if I'm on stage, I'll go, hi, you know, I'm a Christian, let's say, right? And so two or three people would just blurt out, no, tell them you're a Calvinist, and it'll be like that, and they're trying to make this distinction, and... For whatever reason, I don't know if it had to do with Discord. I don't know if it has to do with there's just a lot of reform people here, which there are. Um, I think for whatever reason, um, they just kind of want to make Calvinism out to be some cult or just some, you know, just some aberrant uh, view of orthodoxy or uh, just something abhorrent or, you know, it just uh, it just amazes me at how. Uh, they're trying to vilify Calvinism, at least here on, on Clubhouse. Well, I was trying to speak with her last night. Here again, you know how that's difficult to do because, you know, she, she's, she runs 90 miles an hour all the time. It's, it's difficult to actually What are you talking engage. about, Tony? Uh, oh, Chrissy, Chrissy Watson? What's your, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, man, she is really, she's like a, I mean, like this Energizer Bunny on steroids type of, just, very, I mean, she, it's, all, it's hard to get a word in with her, but she does hate Calvinism. When I was trying to talk, James Corletto was in the room, and he interrupted me while I was talking, and he's like, well, Johnny, it's because her dad, um, her dad passed away, and he was an atheist. I think that's what he said. I'm pretty sure that's what he said. Um, so maybe that's why she has this sort of animus towards Calvinism is because she looks at it as like, you mean to tell me God is only going to choose some and doesn't even give others a chance or whatever? You know how a lot of them hold the opposition to that. So maybe that's her driving force behind why she dislikes Calvinists, I guess. Um, but man, she really does. But it, it's one thing to not like it. That's fine. But she just totally misrepresented it. As I said, she said, well, the Calvinists, you know, strip God of his mercy. And I'm like, that, that is actually one of the fundamentals that, uh, you know, Calvinists and those of the Reform highlight about that doctrine is his mercy. So I'm like, where are you getting this stripping God of his mercy stuff? Uh, it was just such a bizarre interaction, to be honest with you. She's been heckling me for a better part of a year now, Johnny. Uh, you've experienced one instance, I guess. She just goes after me. All she can just get. If I start to speak, she'll, she'll just start interrupting me, and going off Calvinism this and Calvinism that. Well, I mean, she's confronted me before, of course. But you know, she was asking me about free will, and I was explaining to her that you know you're, you're really going to do what your nature influences you to do, and this goes the same for. You know, why fig trees don't produce pineapples. They're only going to produce what their nature is to do and things like that. And she act, she sort of acted like she understood what what I was talking about, uh, you know, analogously at perhaps. But, man, when it goes back to that, to that uh, God choosing, she does not like that at all. She is under the belief, I guess that God has offered salvation to everyone and then it's just up to you, the individual, 
to, to make decisions, but at least God has, you know, sort of put it out there. And the Calvinist doctrine is, well, no, God actually doesn't put it out there for everyone. And I think that's where she really drizzles at that. And perhaps it does have something to do with, uh, you know, one of her, her loved ones, in this case, I guess her dad, um, that had passed away as an atheist. According to James Corlett, I think I miss, uh, I think I heard him correctly and I didn't misunderstand what he said. But that, that would make more sense as to why she really confronts Calvinists the way she does. But, man, she's on a tear, I tell you that. But it is a hard pill for a lot of people to swallow, as you know. Even, you know, the Armenians, they... You know, they uh, sort of rail against Calvinism, reform, etc. because, you know, just this idea that, wow, you mean to tell me God just simply does not choose everyone, doesn't even offer it to everyone. God didn't, int I've said this before, I said, God actually did not intend to save everyone. Well, that, that really gets under people's skin. And I'm, and I'm, I'm showing them that this is part of of this, this doctrine, of course, it's biblical, that, you know, God chooses whom he will. Um, and it's just, it's just such a hard pill for so many people to swallow. Um, not just atheists that want to discuss the doctrines and things like that, but a lot of people that, you know, that, that profess to be Christians. They're just in a different sort of denominational camp, I guess, but it really does bother a lot of people. It's, it's, in other words, it's like if they think they had to accept the doctrine, uh, they wouldn't like God. It's like I can't like a God that only chooses some people and never intended to choose everyone or never intended to try to save everyone. If God is simply choosing a select few and just overlooking the rest, like they don't even have a chance, then I can't like that God. Well, that to me is very problematic. You can't like God if you were to accept the uh, the reformed that the reformed position is true. It is biblical. You wouldn't like God because of that. Very problematic, I see. For example, I tend to ask a lot of people these particular questions if they have some sort of um, an unorthodox view of, say, Christianity. Like, for example, um, I was talking to a friend of mine. He said, "Yeah, I'm a Christian." But I don't believe in hell. So, what do you mean you don't believe in hell? I mean, Scripture talks about hell. What are you talking about? No, I just don't believe it. I think these are metaphors, and I think this is just figurative language to sort of show a point or whatever. You know, he went through a, a whole host of reasons why he says he doesn't believe in hell. And I asked him, I said, if you were to be convinced or you were to accept that there is indeed a place that is alive with torment, an everlasting hell, I said, if you were to accept that, would you still love God? He said, no, I couldn't do it. I said, really? I said, so if you were to accept that there is a hell, you would sort of disband yourself from God. You could not like God anymore. You couldn't love God anymore. He said, yeah, no, I couldn't. That makes sense to me, though, why people do want to dismiss hell. Because it's like, I only want to be a Christian on the basis that there's no hell. But if there is a hell... Well, I can't be a Christian. That just tells me that you want to be a Christian on your terms. You're not interested in being a Christian on God's terms. It's very problematic. And then much less you, you go into details about the Reformed faith. They really, they really find that to be rigid and abrasive, and they don't like it. I think that's an emotional uh, response to that as to why they don't like it. Well, yeah, Johnny, um, this this guy in front of yours who's a Christian, I mean, if uh, he believes at least some of the Christian story in Scripture, and he doesn't believe there's a hell, what in the world does he think Christ came for? What was the point? I mean, if there's no hell, what is he, what is he coming for? Who is he saving? I, well, that's that was a good question. We talked a little bit about that. I think some of those people look at it as... Well, Christ came uh, so that people, some people could enjoy heaven and the rest just simply go into nothingness. So 
being in heaven is better than just not existing at all. But I said, but the people that you think are just going to nothingness, it's not like they're missing heaven or it's not like they're regretting or feeling absent and, and, and all of these things. It's, you, you're just, you're nothing. There is no, there is no reflection on that. But that's the way he seems to look at it. Jesus just provided a, a way for some people to experience eternal bliss and the rest, well, they're not really hurt by it. They just don't get to experience it. That was his sort of position to that. Um, but the, to me, that doesn't really uh, that doesn't really flush in accordance with with what Scripture teaches about hell being uh, eternal. And some people argue about whether it's eternal or not. But Scripture does, of course, teach about hell. But there's so many people that I've met that actually want to dismiss that altogether. Oh no, that's not really talking about hell. That's just some sort of figure of language. God is just trying to make a point here of how much he, uh, you know, dislikes sin. But no one really goes to a place of hell. Okay, that that tells me that person um, could not really be a Christian if they were to accept hell is indeed real. And again, I meet more and more people like that. The more and more people want to discuss their own beliefs, because a lot of people say, oh, I, I don't want to want to talk about it, I don't want to discuss it, whatever. But the ones that do, I'm finding more and more, the further down in their their particular beliefs that you go and, and sort of uncover, you get to discover really what they're, they really do believe. And it's just unbiblical. But it comes from, I think, an emotional perspective. Again, I can only be a Christian if there's no hell. But if there is a hell, well, I can't like God for that. I couldn't be a Christian anymore. That's, that's an emotional reason as to why. It's not a, It's not really a biblical reason. Yeah, but I don't know, John, because I'm thinking that, you know, the issue is you would still have, like, if you want to say that all of these scriptures and texts that mention hell, they should be, you know, sort of like saying that they're a metaphor or something of that. I think um, you can just run the same point the opposite direction. Why couldn't you say that about heaven, right? I mean, a similar description is just one is being mentioned as eternal bliss and the other one's being mentioned as... Uh, you know, eternal punishment. So why, why should we think one is an allegory and then one is real and there's this real place, you know? What, what's the justification for that, right? So it seems like you're going to pick up the Maslow go pro pro. Yeah, it's a double standard. It's like, well, why is this just some sort of figure of speech? But heaven is very literal in the context. Why is it that? <laughs> I mean, that's a very good point. Um... But you look at a, um, I think, what is it, a universalist that believes, well, everyone, it's not like some people go into nothing. That's just that everyone gets to, to heaven, so to speak. They, they just discount hell and, and annihilation and things like that. Have you ever seen Say La Vie talk, Johnny? Yeah, I have. I, I have had her in my rooms before. Yeah, and what she says is, I have good news for you. All of you are going to heaven. This is, this is her good news, according to her, right? And then, so... She says all of this, uh, and, and then everyone goes, the response to this is, oh, we, we like your God. And I'm like, it's the eye roll. It's like, oh, you know, it's a big red flag when a bunch of atheists are, like, liking a particular God or, you know. It's just, uh, to me, uh, they just don't love the truth. Yeah, I, I remember her. It was... Uh... I think Selah V and Matt Yester was in my room and she was talking about all this and she had a problem with, with you know, the, the whole hell thing there. And um, and you're right, it does seem to be a red flag when an atheist says, oh, well, you know what, I don't believe in your God, but hey, who cares? I'm still good. I'm still safe. I, I still get to heaven whether I believe it or not. So your God, you know, he doesn't sound like he's as big of, a, uh, of an asshole as like John Lee's God or Johnny's God. <laughs> Or something like that but it's really a problem and just like I was talking to an individual last night I said it sounds to me like you see people that are in hell as victims he said yes I do I, well, I can kind of tell that <laughs> you know and I think that's how um, perhaps people like say la vie 
see see hell's inhabitants. Well, they're just all victims. So I mean, you know, we're, we're not victims here. It's almost like blaming God in a sense for you to accept that. Well, wait a minute. This this is all God's fault. These people in hell are victims. This is it's an indictment against God. Is really what it is. But they want to create God to be this 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 Santa Claus, I guess. That you know really gets gives everybody you know some gift of some sort, some better than others, whatever. But everyone at least gets some sort of prize, I guess. And that is just not in keeping with Scripture. It's like, look, you're not disagreeing with me. Where are you getting this at in Scripture? And you know they they, they, they struggle to, to to show that, of course. And it's not even it's not even common. I. I see this more and more nowadays than I did years ago. Uh, but, uh, you know, anyway, they, they just do not like, they do not like the God that you would talk about, John. The Reformed faith. They do not like that at all because they see people as, well, wait a minute, God didn't even give some people a chance? I mean, it's one thing to give them a chance and they reject it. But at least give them a chance. At least make the offer. And you're saying God doesn't even offer it at all. Oh, this is terrible. God's such a, you know, to not even give these people a chance. This is mean. This is not a loving God. We can't follow God like that. Well, I, I see it as a big problem because here again, I see it as biblical. Jake, I wanted to, I wanted to mention to you, well... When we were in uh, Matt's room, uh, you guys were talking about other things. But you know, I wanted to—you were talking about, uh, or well, we were talking about engaging atheists. Why atheists sometimes don't really go after you in some of those rooms and etc. Um, like, for example, I, I would certainly say, as as far as being high on the smart chart of philosophical discussion, you, I mean, you're way up there. And I'm not a philosophy guy, as you, as you know, you probably remember. Um, and, and, and if I were to say <laughs> to my friends, hey, you know what, I'm slated to have a, a debate with, with Jake on philosophy, my friends would even tell me, well, Johnny, you're, you're just about ready to get your ass whooped. <laughs> but I admit that I'm just not a philosophy guy. But the thing is, though, one of the reasons why I'm not so much of a philosophy guy now, I am entertained by two people, like, for example, if you and Jack were to have a discussion about philosophy. Yeah, I'd be entertained by that. But one of the other reasons why I'm not a philosophy guy is because I don't say that, you know, I became a Christian by way of philosophy. Yeah, hey, now, John, is it possible the world is a book and be a philosophy? Is there a possible world in which I could do what? Where, where you can be a philosophy guy? Yeah. Are you just trolling Johnny now? Yeah, yeah, John, I think you're trolling me now. What, what do you think, Katie? Do you, do you recognize the, the trolling there with yeah. what he just asked? Yeah, I troll. figured that's what Take he's I knew it. I knew what he was doing there. Uh, no, I'm just not a philosophy guy because here again, I don't say I became a Christian by way of studying philosophy. Now, I think if I can recall, I don't want to misrepresent him. Jake, you can maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember back in the day, when Justin uh, Khalil had just first abandoned atheism, I think he was saying to me and some others that uh, what was one of the catalysts that brought him to Islam was philosophy. I think that's what I remember him saying. Okay, that's fine. If, if that's what you're going to say, philosophy got me to X, then yeah, it would stand to reason that you should actually have discussions about philosophy because you're saying that is one of the, the key mechanisms that, uh, that was utilized to bring you to a certain point. That makes that does make sense. But for me, I, I don't say philosophy got me to Christ. I don't say you know, these these even evidentialist uh, arguments or the Kalam arguments, things like that. That is what got me to Christ. That is why, to me, it's like I, I, I don't just feel I really need to. Uh, become a student of philosophy. Not for that reason only, I just don't really like it as much. But again, I don't I don't use that as a as a means to say this is what got me to Christ or this is what can get you to Christ. 
do some sort of philosophical study. Well, I actually mentioned that, and, and Jake, I remember him saying, well, couldn't God use philosophy uh, to to have the unbeliever uh, believe in, in, in Jesus Christ? And, well, my actual answer is no. And I guess he said, well, there's people that do uh, make that such a claim. And I thought the Paul did. Pe- is, is that not right? I'm sorry to interrupt, but I thought Paul used philosophy with the the Gentiles or was it the Greeks? I don't know. Some people who like yeah, like uh, you know Mars Hill, that kind of a thing. Yeah. You know, the unknown God, all of these things. Yeah, so but, that's that's good then, right? That, that should be something to emulate. Use, well, use no, works with whatever group of people. That's what Paul seemed to be trying to do. Well, but Paul was not saying, you know what, if you want to find Jesus Christ, you first must study philosophy. You first must understand philosophy. Yeah. And I don't, I don't say that to, to people as well, too. Put your trust in Jesus Christ. I don't talk about forgiveness and repentance and things like that, but here's what you must first do. You must first understand philosophy in order to get you to Christianity, or to get you to Christ. I, I don't say that. Yeah, no one said Paul said that. What Paul did was, it seems, that he found people who were already philosophically minded, and so he used that mode to talk to them. Um, right, like it would be interesting for me to actually read what he said, Haiti. Uh, it was certainly not some argumentation with premises and conclusions. No, uh, that's basically fine. Said, you people like to talk about these things. It basically goes like that. And you talk about it every day. And I even noticed that, uh, you know, you have this uh, statue here about an unknown God. Now let me tell you about, uh, you know, yeah. this God, right? And he's telling them that he's not arguing. He's saying pretty much matter-of-factly there's a God of heaven. But he was he's not providing reasons right. for this. Would you call that code switching, if you know what that is? Um, not exactly, no. The code switching is... Um, um, you might talk one way to your, you know, grandmother, and another way to your, uh, you know, middle school friends. Um, uh, Paul it, even said he's all things to all men, for the sake what? of... Okay, I, I didn't hear what you're saying, because I was still... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying that, isn't that what Paul was doing? Like, it's like, okay, this this is the kind of way of talking that will get through to these people, because this is how they see the world. Isn't that what, that's what I thought he was doing. He's, he's meeting people on their terms. He's right. talking their language, so to speak. But just talking their language doesn't mean he's providing argumentation or some sort of philosophical proofs or evidence. Isn't it, uh, isn't, this is not isn't it an apologetic, John? It's an apologetic, I, I agree. But, that, but there's a, there seems to be a certain idea of what apologetics even represents. Yeah, but I've heard you n- numerous times say that you don't consider yourself an apologist. So I, I do not. Why, why is that? Is it, is it you wouldn't endorse that term in any sense? Or just no, based on the way that you think it's typically used? If, if I'm asked for, the, for what I believe and why I believe it, uh, that is um, uh, apologia. In other words, right, according to First Peter 3.15. However, what I consider an apologist is sort of like a, like a preacher, in a sense. Like, uh, if it is such the case that, like, someone's asking me certain questions and I tell them something, well, that would be preaching. But I don't consider myself a preacher, in other words. And so what I consider an apologist is someone who goes out to someone like a mass slick, maybe, or, or something well, like that. You consider Jake an apologist? I think he identifies himself as a guy. Yeah? Is that correct, Jake? Yeah. But, but, but John, the thing is that uh, even the, the verse that you keep mentioning, First Peter 3.15, it mentions that very same word, right? That's what, I, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, so, it mentions that. Well, so in well, some it, sense, but, but hold on, John. In some, sense, in some sense, the person who's giving that defense Mm-hmm. Would be called an apologist, right? I mean, it's, that, that's correct. Yeah, so I'm saying, in a sense, you would adopt the term just with your understanding of, of what the verse is saying, correct? 
Uh, I would say that I'm, con I'm, con I'm conducting an apology, uh, which is not necessarily... <laughs> You're an apologist. The person who's doing it is an apologist. Come on, John. Mm. Uh, how am I going to put this? Uh, Why are you using that around. term? Why not just say, say you accept the term, but based on a particular way of explaining it? What's the problem? See, this is my issue with you, John, is many times if people define things a certain way, you will try to avoid that term just because they use it differently. Why not just put forward your own understanding of it and say, yeah, I can be an apologist, but this is what I mean. What's the problem? It, it, it's kind of like if I, listen, if I mess around with chemicals and even, uh, uh, you know, um, at, you know, uh, you know, conduct even an experiment, let's say, right? Well, I'm messing around with chemistry. Uh, but am I a chemist? No. And so that's how I kind of consider apology an apologist. So when does, some, when does it convert? Like when does somebody become considered an apologist? Right? Like doing the first they two or three mm -hmm. so, Yeah, but you, you, you do what's being said in first Peter three fifteen. So like, when does it convert over to become an apologist? That's what I'm asking. Um. Okay. Maybe maybe a term like professional apologist could be inserted in there. I'm not I'm not saying professional. Okay, I mean, I'm that's fine. Professional in the sense of like maybe making an income with it, but in in that sense of, I mean, you could take the professional out. Maybe even add amateur apologist or something like that. But there's a certain label of apologist that I think has a certain connotation that represents a sort of a. Uh, 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 but he's asking, an intention. He's asking you what the tipping point is, right? You know, that was the question. Like, when does a non-apologist become an apologist? In the same way that a chemist, you know, someone fooling around with a chemistry set becomes a chemist. Well, the chemist one's obvious, right? There's some kind of academic credentials, right? You couldn't even call yourself a chemist unless you've got a degree or something like that. Well, someone might be able to call themselves a chemist, if, even if they don't have a degree. Yeah, well, okay. That's an edge case. Um, I think it's a bad analogy, right? Unless you want to say apologists have to be paid and credentialed, which I just don't think anyone... No, no that's not what I'm implying. Right, so um, what's the tipping point? I think the tipping point is, uh, one would be identity, for one, how one identifies okay. themselves. So they would just have to call themselves. Yeah, I think that's probably reasonable. If they call themselves... Yeah. An and they and they do apologist things. They're an apologist. I think we want that. Yeah. Well, let's and see. I, let's I don't. See, but, I don't. But, I don't John, for myself. But exactly, and I'm saying, and I'm trying to get down to what possibly the motive is for that, right? Because you see yourself doing what is in First Peter three fifteen, and presumably somebody that does that is an apologist in some sense, right? It, you just don't want to use the label. I think you just don't want to use the label because you think that. It has some other connotation that you wouldn't attach to yourself, and you don't want it to be misconstrued. Well, let's just say it this way, right? Um, but that's never stopped uh, you before, John. There are, times, there are times when I actually preach, James, uh, not uh, Jake, and it will be like, "This is what Scripture says." Uh, you know, it'll be like a little uh, preaching, right? And then some people say, "No preaching." So I don't deny that I'm preaching. But to, to, to say that because I'm preaching there in that little instance, that, that I'm going to identify as a preacher, there's a certain understanding of preacher, apologist, in my view, that I don't want to accept the label of identity. Yeah, and that's what I, that's what I was saying. Like, what is the tipping point? As here you said, that, well, one would be self-identification. Now, just uh, just because I preach does not make me a preacher. I don't know if you will. Uh, you may argue if you're. No, preaching, I agree with that. Preacher. Just if somebody lies once, does it make them lie again? Well, I would say yes. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, I, I the liar, liar the liar is irrespective of whether someone chooses that identity for themselves or not. I'm just saying, you see how your intuition is different. That some of these things, you may have to only perform the action once, and then you think the label fits. But with the, with the preaching of the apologist case, 
you don't think that that's the case. So that's yeah. why I'm trying to see like what the difference so, is. So as, as far as identity, uh, like, hi, I, I'm John. I have lied, so I, I'm John the liar, right? This is my identity I choose for myself, right? That's not the case. So in the case of liar, it's really uh, sort of a label that someone puts on you, like a jacket, in a sense. And so I think in that sense, a liar, preacher, apologist, it would would be something that someone else wants to put on you, not something that you are accepting for yourself, even though you have lied, preached, or uh, provided an apology. If that makes any sense. Yeah, I, I think people that get in debates, all of them are apologists, whether you're uh, you know, Christian or Muslim or whatever. I look at it being an apologist as sort of a modus operandi. This is what you do. You know, someone asks you, well, why are you a Christian? Oh, well, let me tell you all about it. Let's look at the historicity of Jesus. Let's look at the Gospels. Let's analyze that. Let's let's talk about how it indicates eyewitness testimony. Let's go through all of these different things. As I think the apologist, in, in the way I see it, they're, they're taking more of a position, whether they realize it or not, based on how they uh, interact with others. They're using that in a sense to persuade right and and i think i think uh, as as jake and and haiti are saying i'm just saying it doesn't have to be used so if you're engaged in this well then you're an apologist kind of like and they're saying that to me yeah because like and john listen these guys use absolutely. terms that you don't accept how they use them all the time and you will choose not to use it in the way that they do, and you, but yet you'll still use the term. I mean, I can give you some controversial examples if you like, like like man and woman, right? I mean, <laughs> so oh, yeah. uh, oh my so, goodness! I mean, I've so, had, I mean, how many uh, hours? I think about twelve hours. They were just on me about that particular topic. But you see what I'm saying, though, John? It's like if in certain instances you will use the same terminology differently, right? But in this case, it, there's something particular about it, but you don't want to do that. And I'm just saying, why not just reclaim the term in, in, in the same way that you would like okay. this other stuff, man? So, stuff. so in other words, I guess what I'm trying to say, Jake, is um, I personally think that people are allowed to, um, you know, use words and define the own terms that they use. Uh, it, it, I think it's unfair if someone says, no, you have to use it this way. Now, if there's a certain standard, like a, a standard in philosophy, uh, one can say, well, in philosophy anyway, this is how it's understood. And it would make more sense if we use the words how it's understood so that we can communicate better or something like that. That would be a reasonable type of a request. But when it comes to other things, like, in the case of man, woman, male, female, all these things, well, I have a certain idea of it, and they're trying to prescribe a certain mean force, in fact, a certain meaning, and they're very, uh, I would say, like Nazi about it. And and I think it's, I think a lot of these discussions hinges on on how one understands words because the words have entailment, right? The semantics, you know, uh, lead to certain concepts and conclusions and this is what they're attempting to do so it's all about to me getting you to agree with certain words now with regard to the word apologist it's really not a big deal there's not like no you're an apologist no i'm not yes you are because yeah, it, it's it's really it basically comes it. down to it's not something that you're really that interested in claiming so you just don't care that's basically what it is yeah, I choose not to identify one. Now, if you want to consider me an apologist... Like if somebody called you that, would you be offended? Then that's fine. Yeah, like, John, if somebody called you that, would you be offended? Uh, no, but uh, I would probably tell them I don't identify as one. Okay. But you're free to call me one. Yeah, I mean, look at it this way, Jake. I mean, if you're working on... Uh, cars or something, whatever, in your backyard, and you take a welder to stick a, stick a bead on, a, on, on something you're wanting to, to mesh together, well, you may be able to know how to do that. Kind of 
Or, or yeah, but I mean, I wouldn't say because I can run a bead across a piece of metal that I'm using to to, to, to do something on my car. Am I, am I now going to say I am a welder? Mm, no, I wouldn't say that. Yeah, but Johnny, he's doing it all day long, like 24-7, 365. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's, I, get, I'm, I hear what you guys are saying, but the I don't think it's directly analogous to John and his activities. That's all I'm saying. You can say, you can say he's an amateur apologist, if you want to express it that way, but he's certainly not just a guy who goes, you know, when he has an issue with his car or his wife's car, you know, he pops the hood and, you know, tunes it up or something like that once in a blue moon. He's on here how many hours a day, Johnny? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I see what you're saying. And if a person is wanting to enter a debate, um, then that may be a bit of a different story. Like, for example, some atheists would confront me and say, ah, your, your Bible, your 1 Peter 3.15 says, you have to debate me, Johnny. Well, no, that's not what it says. That's what they think it says. And they're just trying to use that to goad you into, um, you know, being a participant in their little interrogation process and, and their little game that they want to play. I, I but you if I'll give you another example, Dick. Uh, they call me a debate bro. Now, I don't accept that label, but I noticed Pedro, he actually identifies as a quote-unquote debate bro. And so some people... Yeah. Don't that. <laughs> that was funny, actually, John. Or that? That was actually pretty funny, though, when he did it, because he only, if you notice, he only did it after he recognized who he was, and he's like, <laughs> oh, I'm, you thought you, you're dealing with Pedro here, and I'm a debate bro. <laughs> And just, I don't know the way he was talking. It was funny to me. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm saying. So it, it, a lot of it has to do with what label a person wants for themselves and what label someone wants to find them. Now, with respect to some of the transgender people that we have here, uh, maybe a particular person might want to assign a particular label to an individual but that individual themselves don't want to accept that label and they prefer another label. And, and what, we, what we see here is some people trying to force labels on other people. I just kind of say, listen, I may have a view on that, but if you're going to identify as whatever you're going to identify, uh, then, then I'm just going to say that I, I'm, I'm going to kind of permit you to, to, to make that label. And that's just how I view it. Now, like I said, you're free to call me an apologist, anybody. I just don't prefer that label for myself. Do I engage in apology? Yes, of course. I just don't think I qualify or would consider myself an apologist. No, I'm just, I'm not pressing you to call yourself that. I'm just questioning, you know, trying to understand. Yeah, the so. Well, I mean, would you, Jake, would you consider yourself a Muslim apologist? Um, yeah, in English, sure. What is it in Arabic? You can see it in my, my profile, dying. Now, Matt Adams, on the other hand, now he is a great apologist, and, and I just defer, when atheists try to confront me, I just defer them to Matt Adams because he is sort of the. I would see Matt Adams as the apologist of all apologists. So, um, so that's I just defer people to him, and he can uh, he can school the atheists and I show them that, the error of their ways. Do you identify? Oh, Matt was in Steam. Out of curiosity, because I've never heard you actually explicitly say hi. Uh, I'm Matt. I'm an apologist uh, for Christianity. I've never heard anything like that come out of your mouth. But I have heard Johnny say the great apologist Matt Adams or something like that. I've heard that many. Well, if you're going to enter in debates and things like that, um, like you, you remember the one of the recent ones Matt had with, with Tom, uh, you know, Tom Rabbit, I, I would say that in this case, if someone just tuned in, said they didn't know Matt Adams. If they just tuned in to that, that debate, I'm assuming they would have uh, characterized him as, a, as an apologist. And I don't think that's a negative connotation. 
if that's what you do, if that's sort of your modus operandi, as I said, if that's what you do, and that's what you enjoy, and you like the debates, then yeah, you could say you're an apologist. I used to say I was an apologist years ago, an evidentialist apologist at that. But, um, but it, it, I just look at it, it depends on, is this who you are, as you mentioned, the identity? Is this what you do? Do you debate? Do you, uh, do you get in these type of discussions where you're presenting your your view, you're defending it, you're trying to uh, poke holes in the other person's uh, uh, views that wants to criticize yours and things like I mean, you know how the process goes. And if that is what you are involved in, then I, I would probably say you, you would be an apologist. John, would you say that would apply to John Lee then? Because to me, what you just described sounds like John Lee. It sounds like well, he does. Here, here's the thing with, with, with Johnny Lee, though. John is, he, he's a different type of cat. Um, he will tell you that he does not get in debates in a way to try to prove uh, that God is real to an atheist or uh, to try to prove, uh, you know, Jesus Christ as being the Son of God. He's, he's not doing it in the sense of trying to persuade them. Uh, and he will tell you that. So... I think John is, is, is a little different in that regard. I mean, the way Some I other it, Johnny, is like... Do you agree with that, John? Uh, yeah. No, I, I definitely agree with that, but as far as the label's concerned, I, I do consider, like, apologist uh, sort of a, a, um, a label that, to me, has certain prerequisites, and, and, and uh, I just don't qualify for that. Uh, like, if I, for example, like preacher... If, I, if I'm going to identify as a preacher, it's not just because I preach that I've become a preacher. It's like, you know, there's some sort of seminary involved, maybe, some sort of ordination, uh, these type of things. And then, yes, okay, I qualify as being a preacher. Apologists, I don't consider that much different. Clearly, like Paul, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul could be understood as an apologist. Uh, you know, he's sent by God and so forth. And, uh not, not that, not that God's not working through me, uh, you know, but it, I, just the label itself. Maybe, maybe I don't consider myself worthy of that label. I, th it's more like that, if anything. Well, I think Haiti calls me more of a preacher than a debater, and I'll accept that because you know the way I look at it. And this is what I'm sort of talking with Jake earlier about philosophy and stuff like that again if if you whatever religion you you're uh, espousing if you're going to claim that philosophy got you there then yeah it makes sense to to have a debate or discussion about philosophy pertaining to your particular religion because you're claiming that is the one of the roads or methods or keys whatever it is one of the catalysts that got you to where you're at uh, but That's this, fine. But, but this is what I'm saying. Like, when you said, yeah, I'll accept that when Haiti calls you a preacher, right? Well, I would accept if Jake or anyone else called me an apologist, right? The difference is the choice of identity, right? I, w I don't think I've ever seen you in the many years I've known you say, hi, uh, I I'm Johnny Haas. I'm a preacher or I'm a, I'm a Christian preacher or anything like that. Do you get what I'm trying to say a little bit? Uh, actually, John, you're wrong. I have a business card that I hand out, and it does say Johnny the Preacher. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, I, I get what you're saying, but, you know, in a sense, as far as the, definitionally speaking, I mean, all Christians are supposed to be preachers, so to speak. Uh, we're, we're to preach the good news. We're to spread the gospel. That's what a preacher does. But, um, I mean, a preacher goes more, of course, into detail into what things mean and et cetera, rather rather than simply just relaying a message and reading from scripture. Uh, but but what I'm saying regarding to what I was talking to, to, um, to Jake earlier about is that whatever means that you are claiming as to how you get to X, then sure, you should stay in that particular lane and you, it makes sense to have a discussion. Some people would say a debate about it. I don't really look at it from my point of view as a debate, but if you're going to say, for example, and let's say a, a Christian says, well, you know what, I, I became a Christian because, uh, you know what, I went to seminary. Okay, then you should be able to defend that in a sense of why, do not, why doesn't other people that went to seminary 
become Christians. Why is it that some people that who are atheists will tell you they did go to substantiate as per your claim? Whatever you're saying got you to where you're at. That is what you're going. Broken and so forth. It's well, it's, it's physically impossible for one, but you know the conditions are in place where it's metaphysically impossible as well. Could it, could it be metaphysically impossible doing it in a theist world? Uh, no. When you say it's eternal, do you mean it has no beginning and no end? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, cool. Thank